So the next talk is called Catch Me If You Can in the Eyes of Authorization. It's by Cameron Vincent and Sean. And they are going to talk about a little bit more of that cloudy, abusey stuff of our cloud services. So welcome. All right, thank you, Jessica. You all can hear me all right, right? Cool. So, hello. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta, this is crazy. So the first Blue Hat I ever attended was Blue Hat 2017. And it's just crazy because I remember when I was there and I was just kind of starting out in the InfoSec world. I was dabbling in bug bounties a little bit and I was still in school and some Microsoft folks I knew at the time invited me because I was participating in their program. And it's, it's just crazy because I remember being there. And I remember meeting the people I met and seeing some of the talks and even who presented. But I don't ever remember saying to myself, do you see yourself speaking there at some point? And it's crazy years later, here I am. So, you know, it's interesting to see all the wheel turns. With that being said, big thank you to the Blue Hat team for having Sean and I here. Really appreciate it. And of course, the audience as well. You all make the event what it is. So big thank you. Okay, so as you all can see, this is a collab talk. So my name's Cameron Vincent, and Sean Hinchy will come up a little bit later to do his own side and introduction. But I do kind of want to give a little bit of a preamble or basic overview of this talk. So as you all can see, the title of this talk is Catch Me If You Can in the Eyes of Authorization. So before I joined Microsoft, I used to be a former full-time bug bounty hunter. And there was a specific type of vulnerability I always aimed in on and looked for. Kind of like how Callum was hunting for something specific, I did something similar, just something different. And don't get me wrong, if it was in the OWASP top 10, I was looking for it. But there was one I always aimed in on. So the goal of this talk is I'm going to be explaining the offensive side, okay? What it was like finding these, some techniques, strategies, and methods. And then Sean's gonna come up and talk about the defensive side, what it was like being at Microsoft when I was sending these in, and some automated tooling he made, which in his own words, to mimic me to create a robot version of me. Now, I don't know about all of you, but when I first heard about this, it sounded like they were trying to put me out of a job. But it's okay, we love the tooling, and the goal here is manually testing this takes a lot of time. So if you own a big service or company and you wanna test this, manually testing it takes forever. So the goal is hopefully Sean's tooling automates this. Now, I hope I remembered, okay. Cool, I already kind of gave a basic introduction, so I'm not gonna go too deep in this, but as I said, my name's Cameron Vincent, and I'm a former full-time bug bounty hunter. I now work on the vulnerability and mitigations team in the Microsoft Security Response Center. It's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially, we deal with all external security reports coming into us from external researchers, so we decide you know, how serious is it, how quickly does it need to get fixed, and we'll work with engineering from there. And we also have our own little research projects on the side. I do want to say big shout out to the team I'm on. They're doing really incredible work and I really do love the team I'm on. So big shout out to them. I do have my blog here also. I will dive a little bit into that later, but if you're interested in reading some other bugs and stuff that I found, I have some written up on there, but as I said, I will dive a little bit deeper into that later. Okay, offensive side of finding authorization issues. Now earlier I said there was a specific type of issue that I looked for. Well, what am I talking about? So the issue I'm talking about are called cross-tenant data leaks, or CTDL for short. And it's a really straightforward issue, okay? Basic premise is someone in tenant A being able to escalate and access info in tenant B. Really straightforward. Another way is look at tenant as a synonym for company or organization. Okay, basic premise is someone in company A being able to escalate and access info in company B, or organization A or organization B. Another way to look at it is, for those that like Azure AD or G Suite, which is now called Google Workspace or whatever, and that was not an affiliated advertisement, I'm just trying to be accurate here, but basic premise is someone in Azure AD tenant A, or G Suite organization A being able to escalate in Azure AD tenant B, or G Suite organization B. So really straightforward. Now, these issues are not your average like local privilege escalation issues. A great example is in Callum's talk, right? You had to become a guest user in the Microsoft tenant, and you could look at that as a barrier, okay? You know, or like, let's say, you know, you gotta gain access to a machine or, an, or a network, and then from there, laterally move your way up. Not with these issues, there's really no barrier here. The only barrier is finding that vulnerable API. And then, generally, you need some type of ID, 
like an email address, an account, an organization ID, but we don't really consider IDs defenses. So the goal here is finding the vulnerable API and you generally are good to go. So scope and impact of these can be pretty large. So this is kind of a basic overview diagram of how these issues look. So on the far left, that, yes, from your side, far left, customer one or tenant A, they're in their own little world, okay? So they got their own users, their own groups. If it's an Azure AD tenant, their own Azure subscriptions. If it's a G Suite tenant, their own G Suite subscriptions. And it's all nice and they're in their own world. Then on the far right, same exact thing, okay? You got tenant B or customer two, they're in their own little world also. You know, they have their own users, groups. If it's an Azure AD tenant, Azure subscriptions. If it's a G Suite tenant, G Suite subscriptions, right? It, everybody's happy. Well, as you can see under the bigger box, on the left side, there's a smaller little box and it says attacker in tenant A has found a CTDL issue where they're able to escalate and leak all users in tenant B. That's the way these work. So here in the middle, you can see there's that barrier that's kind of broken. So an API that has missing proper authorization checks. So the user in tenant A is now able to escalate and leak all users in tenant B. Now in this example, it shows tenant B, but you know, tenant B, C, D, E, F, G, that's kind of like what makes these a little serious is if it's one tenant that's affected, there's a good chance others are. So that's the way these work. Another good example is for those, like if you use Azure AD or you use G Suite, imagine going on there and like clicking on users and all the users in your organization load in front of you. Well, basically imagine all the users in another organization loading in front of you. That's how these cross-tenant data leak issues work. Oh. Okay, so the impact of these, what's, what makes these so impactful? So there's two big things here. First of all, the scope. I know in the previous example it showed, you know, attacker in tenant A was going for tenant B, but, you know, go down the alphabet, tenant B, C, D, E, F, G, the scope can be pretty large. Generally, when these issues are found, every type of tenant is affected in the service. So the scope is there, it can be pretty large. Second, ease of exploitability. Now, I'm not about to stand up here and show you some insane Python code where you gotta set up a interpreter reverse shell on some Kali machine, waiting for a ping back from a machine that doesn't even allow outbound connections and it's all complicated. No, these issues are really straightforward. So straightforward to the point where I did a drive of this talk to a friend of mine and he's not technical but not insanely not technical and at the end of it he was like, that's it. That, that's all it was, and I was like, yeah, that's, that's all it was. So there's also that ease of exploitability kind of vibe to it. Now, before I kind of get into some examples and some techniques, I wanna go over some stats here really quickly. So the two main programs I hunted in were Google and Microsoft, okay? Now, these stats are kind of rough. It wasn't like I could just type in something and it just spewed out everything for me. I had to go manually one by one by the, for this. And we're only counting stats like bugs that were considered important or critical and got paid, no low hanging fruit. So under Google's program, I had about 126 valid submissions and about 24, 25% of those were cross tenant data leaks. And as I said, we're not counting any low hanging fruits in this example. So it was about important to critical and all got paid bounty. Under Microsoft's program, I had about 500 valid submissions and about 7% of those were cross tenant data leaks. And I know these percentages look different, but I had much significantly more Microsoft submissions than I did Google. And you know, if you average it out, the percentages are very, very similar. Now, you could be thinking, Cameron, why should I care about this? Less than 50% of your findings were CTDL issues, less than half. Less than half your time were these cross-tenant data leak issues. Why is this important? So there's two big reasons. The first one is these are not unique to Google or Microsoft in any way. Those are just the two programs I hunted on. But I met many bug bounty hunters over the years and these types of issues is all they would look for. And they would find it on many different services all across the internet. This is not unique to them in any way. There is a big trend right now where APIs are being released without proper authorization. This is a big API development and infosec issue going on in the ecosystem right now. Second, I mean, yeah, these issues can have high impact. So if you were to go look for these right now and you found one on Microsoft or Google and you sent it in, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, it's probably gonna get the highest severity. You're gonna be given the highest bounty. And I'm not talking like you're gonna be getting a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and there's nothing wrong with PB and J. I'm just trying to make a point. You're gonna be eating at the nicest restaurant in your area that week. Like these issues definitely have a, oh wow, 
we need to fix this. This is a very good report. So yeah, like there's a big trend of APIs being released without proper authorization in the whole development world. And then two, these issues can have high impact. All right, so the exciting part. How are these issues found? What examples am I talking about? How did I do it? So we did a dry run of this talk about a week ago to some other MSRC folks, and I was asked to kind of add a slide how I was finding these. And I'm gonna be honest, this is the hardest slide to do because it really just came that naturally to me. I, it's not like I had 100 whiteboards up and sticky notes. I just went, I just went going, you know? Like, I just put full pedal to the metal, and then from there, I just found stuff. But I did think about it, and there were two things I did every morning that kind of, I guess, led to the path that led me to hunt these. So the first thing is focus on new features. Okay, this is a huge, huge thing. And a lot of these like CTDL issues I always found, it was always something new. And not every new feature that comes out is gonna have some serious issue on it, but every time a new feature was released, there was always something. Some, it was always low hanging fruit, or sometimes it was serious, but there was always something there. So new features is a big thing. So Office 365 Message Center, right? Or looking up the roadmap changes. This is all public, you know? You can go all view all updates for changes and things. And this is all the stuff I would read before I went hunting that day. Next up, focus on premium features. Okay, and I get it, right? Like, you don't wanna put your credit card in a service. I mean, I got charged $1,000 once by Azure because I forgot to delete a VM or something. I get it, but the return I made from bounties because of that premium service made up for it. So a lot of CTL issues I found also was always connected to some type of premium feature. So these are two very, very big things that you should focus on when going down that path. Okay, so I'm disclosing two Google bugs and two Microsoft bugs. Before I begin, I wanna say, so every bug I'm disclosing is fixed. I would never disclose anything that's not fixed. Second, these bugs are a couple years old, so some of the settings may be outdated here, but either way, very, very good bugs. So the first Google bug is possible to leak the email subject slash logs for all G Suite organizations. The second one is leak anyone's emails on Gmail slash G Suite email searches. And for those that don't know what G Suite is, I'm just gonna explain it really quickly. It's basically an isolated collaboration environment. Okay, so you can go and you hit create your G Suite account or Google Workspace since that's what it's called now. You enter your own domain, you buy a domain, you create accounts, you can assign them a mailbox, you can assign a Google Cloud instance to your organization. It's an isolated collaboration environment. That's all it is. Now, at one point, G Suite admins had the ability of configuring email log settings that sends all email logs to a Google Cloud data set that they own. Okay, really straightforward, right? And this is the type of info that would be sent in those logs, the subject of the emails, uh, from header display name, just different types of metadata, basically. Well, it was possible to configure your own Google Cloud project to anyone's G Suite tenant and start receiving their logs and seeing emails. Now, you're probably wondering how this was possible. Well, I have a beautiful video proof of concept here that'll show it, but before I start the video, I wanna explain what you're all gonna see here. So in the video, you're gonna see me use a tool called Burp Suite. So for those that don't know what that is, imagine you're on Outlook, okay, and you type up a nice email, and you hit send, and a nice little box comes up, and it said your email sent successfully, and it looks all pretty and beautiful, okay? Well, Burp Suite lets you see all the ugly stuff in the background that nobody wants to look at, basically. So what happens is, when you're sending an email, there's a lot more that goes on. All your authorization tokens and cookies and parameters, that is all sent to Outlook's backend. And then there's a big response that also is returned. It's more than just that little box, I can promise you. So Burp Suite lets us see all of that, and then you can use Burp Suite to try to perform these CTDL escalations and mess with the API directly. So what you're gonna see here, you're gonna see an attacker and victim view, and these are two completely separate G Suite organizations, okay? And you're gonna see on the victim view, they have logging disabled, and then the attacker is gonna go and enable logs in their tenant, and then using Burp Suite, they're gonna escalate it and enable it in a completely different tenant and get their settings in that tenant. Okay, so here's the, so here's the attack review, logs are enabled, and the victim view has logs disabled. So the attacker is gonna go, and they're gonna go enable logging in their tenant with their settings. So this is Burp Suite. You can see it looks really ugly when everything is shown in it. So we're gonna hit save, and this is the request that actually is being sent to G Suite's backend to save your settings. So we send it to the repeater tab, and the next, I, I don't know if you can see it that well, but the next slide dives a little bit deeper into it. There's a little ID that I'm editing here. Okay, that's all this was. All you had to do was put the ID of someone else's G Suite organization and you would save your settings to their tenant. That was it. 
There was nothing else to this. So in this case, it failed because the data set name I was picking was already taken. So I just added the word test or like some random letters or something to the end of it to get it to go through. But you can see once the screen comes up, there we go. This is the ugly response I'm talking about. So we run it again and you'll see the ugly successful response here in a second. I slowed the video down just so I can keep up to speed with it. Okay, now we're gonna go to the victims view and we're just gonna refresh the page, okay? Remember, we did that on the attacker's tenant in a completely different org and now logs are enabled and that's my settings. And all you had to do was put the ID of someone else's G Suite org and you'd be able to do this. So this is the actual request that was in that burp suite repeater tab. So at the bottom right, that was the ID that I was editing. And generally most G Suite tenants, that's what the IDs look like. They're about, uh, I don't know, what is that? Eight, nine characters, 10 characters maybe. And there's not much difference in them. So all you had to do is put someone else's ID there and then you would save your data set settings in their org and start receiving their logs. That was it. Ease of exploitability. And if you can understand this bug, you're gonna understand all the other ones I'm about to talk about. And a little fun fact about this bug to kind of show you the nuances with them. I'm pretty sure everyone here just saw Callum Carney's talk and great talk also, by the way. But he's also a proficient hunter in Google's bug bounty program. And a couple years ago, Google had an event and me and him were in the lobby of the hotel and we were kind of talking about bugs we found. And he mentioned one that I had also found. And I was super confused because we also both got paid. And for those that don't know the way the bug bounty game works is there's no double dipping. First come, first serve. And I was trying to figure, we were trying to figure it out. Like, how did he get paid and how did I get paid? So we were like, okay, Google must have made a mistake. No big deal. Humans make mistakes. We just got paid twice by accident. And it was the same exact bug as this, just a different setting. So imagine like a different setting on a G Suite tenant. All you had to do is put a different ID and you would change their settings. That's all it was. So we were trying to figure out what happened here. Well, we figured it out. When he found it, it was on the old user interface on an old API, and they had a cross-tenant data leak issue on that API. When I eventually came across it, they released a new user interface with a new API, which reintroduced the CTL issue all over again. And the issue came right back. So it shows you the nuances with these bugs. Oh, and this is just a reiteration of what we just went over. So after configuring your own data set, the one's G2 organization, you would start receiving the email logs information to your environment. Okay, so let's go over another one. Leak anyone's emails on Gmail slash G Suite searches. So very similar to the last one, but a different way to do it. So on G Suite, admins have the ability to perform email or email searches in their tenant, okay? And it's just a compliance feature. You know, you can search up a keyword and perform a keyword search for all emails in the tenant. Really, really straightforward. So like, you know, let's say you search up the keyword user, it'll look for all emails with that keyword. Excuse me. So the way G Suite would do it is this. You would perform that search and after it was done, you know, it would look everywhere for that keyword user. And then when it was done, it would append an ID to your search results. And then G Suite would go, okay, hey, we're done with our search here. Go ahead and grab the, all the search results for this ID. And then it would populate right in front of you. I'm pretty sure some of you may know how this is going now. So this is the exact request that you would see in Burp Suite. Okay, it was a get request with like email log, search query equals, and then below that is the ID. All you had to do was put the ID from anyone else's G Suite tenant search results and you would see their emails come right in front of you. That's all you had to do. N nothing more, nothing less, really straightforward. So this is what the actual UI looked like. I really hope you can see that. But essentially, you would hit search. And like I said, imagine the first bug, right? Burp Suite, we used Burp Suite to kind of mess with the ID. So in this case, you would hit search. And now imagine we have Burp Suite open. And you know, let me just, okay, cool. We're back to this request and this is the request you would see and then there's that ID right there, right? So while you have Burp Suite open here, all you'd have to do is put the ID from another G Suite tenant search results and you'd see the results appear right in front of you right here. So this is like the subject of the emails, the dates, the sender, et cetera. Really straightforward. Now you could be thinking, Cameron, those IDs are long. Like what, why should I care about this? Who's gonna guess those IDs? Okay, so we do not consider an ID a security defense. If the ID is static, never changes, and is connected to some form of data, that is not a security defense. So you're telling me like if someone were to leak my ID for my search results, so they can just have access to my search results forever? No, I, I had no idea to reset that ID. That's, you need authorization on those APIs. Another example is, so what, if someone leaks my G Suite tenant ID, they're just good to go to start editing my settings? No, there needs to be proper authorization on these APIs. Another thing is sometimes these IDs are not as unique as you think. 
So there was one Google product I was testing at one point. You got to like create these little like apps in it or whatever. And these are two IDs I got assigned. And they look long, but there's only one letter difference. So IDs, like I said, if it's static, never changes, and it's always connected to some form of data forever, that is not a valid defense. Okay, so as I mentioned, I was gonna mention my blog here really quickly. So if you wanna read more Google examples, they're written up on my blog. And one of the most impactful bugs I ever found is very similar to the ones I just went over. You were able to become a super admin in anyone's G Suite organization. Now, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, that one was not as easy as these other ones are. There was a lot more involved, but it's the same premise. Like, put a different ID here, put a different ID there, next thing you know, you're super admin in their org. And what was nice about that was, in these requests you were messing with, when you were trying to add your account, it let you add an alternate email address, which would also send you the temporary password of your super admin account you were adding. So you were good to go. So much so that Google had trouble reproducing this, and they were like, hey, can you add a super admin to this tenant? And then I did it, and I did it and the next email was like, Nice catch. That's like a famous like response they give. So that's probably one of the most impactful. And there's a video on there and everything. So if you have any questions about it, please reach out to me. All right. So two more bugs here. These are Microsoft examples. Now, again, if you understood the Google ones, you're going to understand these. It's literally the same exact thing. So the first bug from Microsoft is possible to leak slash edit all Azure subscription support ticket attachments and see details of them. The second bug is possible to pay Azure bills with any Azure tenant's credit card. All right, so for the first one on Azure, users have the ability to create support tickets. Shocker, right? And you know whether you have billing questions, subscription questions, you name it, and you can add attachments to these support requests. And you know whether it's a log file or a system error file, you know whatever you can attach whatever you want. And essentially, I'm assuming you can all kind of guess how this is going now. So it was possible to leak the attachments for every single support request and every tenant. You could also actually add your attachment to anyone's support request. I don't really know what the impact of that was. Maybe you could have tricked someone into downloading your file, but the more impact was definitely being able to leak the information. Well, how was this done? Okay, so the next slide actually shows the request much better. But remember, Burp Suite, right? So we had Burp Suite open. It was a get request, and there's an ID there. All you had to do is put the ID from someone else's support request in another tenant, and you'll pull their attachments. That's all it was. So this is the actual request that I'm talking about here. So it's a get request slash support ticket slash there's your ID, you know, and put another ID from a completely different tenant's support request, and you'll see their tenants and or their support tickets attachments. Sorry. And what was interesting about this bug is, you can see it says slash DTM workspaces. Well, what's interesting about this is if you were to remove that part, you would get forbidden. So it wouldn't actually let you see the support request details, but then when you added this, uh, you know, it was like, oh, you're good to go to see attachments then, I guess. So you know, it kind of shows the nuances with these bugs and like the ability, like you really want to test everything. Just because one area doesn't work doesn't mean another won't. So testing everything is very important. All right, uh, I'm gonna run through this because I do want Sean to be able to come up and speak. So the last one, possible pay Azure bills with any Azure tenant's credit card. Again, I'm assuming most of you probably know how this one's gonna go. It's basically the same thing. So on Azure, I, I don't know if this exact way still works anymore, but on Azure, when users use a pay-as-you-go service, you get billed at the end and then you get an invoice sent to you and then you would go try to pay your bill and enter your credit card's payment information, whatever. I'm pretty sure that still exists because that sounds like a normal payment flow, but anyway. So really straightforward, right? Well, it was possible to pay your bills using anyone's credit card from any tenant. Well, how was that possible? So this is what the UI looked like, and that credit card is long expired, so anyone getting any ideas, don't waste your time. And this would be like your invoice sent to you, you would hit pay, pick your card, and you know, all good, right? So again, remember, imagine Burp Suite, right? So this was the request that would be sent, and there would be a payment account ID and then the actual instrument ID of your card. So I'm assuming you all knowing what I'm gonna say here, all you had to do was put the account ID for anyone's billing account and any tenant, and then the instrument ID, which be their specific credit card, and then you would pay your bill with their card. So much so that after you paid your bill, it would send you a nice invoice saying thank you, and it would also show you the last four digits of their card that you used to pay your bill with. So. You know, this is the nuances with these bugs. And one interesting part about this is at the top, there's all these multiple other IDs. These are a lot of requests you'll run across too with testing. Test every ID, you know, get, get creative. So 
you know, maybe you could see someone else's invoice if you tried messing with the original like IDs at the top. So, you know, these kind of show the different nuances with these bugs. All right, defensive side. So I'll have Sean come up here and talk about how he was trying to automate me out of work. Hello, my name is Sean Hinchy, and I am here to talk to you about the defensive side of what Ken was doing. Because if the clicker, eh, 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 um, we obviously we, we we take these kind of exploits pretty seriously, and we a lot of different teams all across Microsoft are going to take a lot of different approaches. I'm here to talk about my specific team, which is the MSRC. Vulnerabilities and mitigations team, same team that Cam's on, uh, but at the time, Cam was not. Cam was finding these bugs. But I was on the team, and we were getting these bugs, and setting in the calls for these bugs, and thinking about, oh my goodness, what do we do about this? And the problem was, is that Cameron is very successful, <laughs> which is good for him. Um, and it's a lot of good, very important bugs, but we can't. This is unsustainable. The, 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 it's across a lot of different vendors, a lot of different companies, and a lot of different services. The, this is a pretty prominent thing. And it's not like historical IDOR, where y y maybe you just change a thing in a URL, but these are for like a lot bigger, more complex services. And Cameron's approach was working. And it's, he's, as he says, this isn't particularly difficult to do. This is not particularly difficult to find. But we, we need to have a way to actually find this. And we need to do it faster than Cameron was. Because we can't keep having incidents every time that Cameron stumbles across one. And it's great that Cameron's finding them, but other people can find them too. And we need to get ahead of the curve, and we needed a solution. So what do finders have? Finders have less information than we do at Microsoft. At Microsoft, we have access to our engineering teams. We have access to internal documentation. We have access to all sorts of people to talk to. We know everything that we own. We don't have to necessarily scrape every domain. We might just have those as indices, things like that. So ostensibly, we have the home field advantage here. And we should press that as much as we can. And that also means that our solution might be slightly different than Cameron's, and maybe it should be. But just to make sure we find it the right way, uh, my team, uh, me and uh, Carolina at the time, though she's not on the team anymore, uh, she's on, the, I believe, the Azure Red team. Hi, Carolina. Um, that we, we went to investigate how we would go about doing this. And we'll start with Cameron, because if nothing else, we should be able to do what Cameron is doing, but faster, or better, or at least automatically. Cameron's solution works, but it's very time intensive. It, it, it's a lot of time sitting down and sieving through every request and every idea and every request. It's not the sort of thing that you can scale. It's not the sort of thing that we can take and give to an engineering team and tell them to sit down. And the way you're going to audit your system is you'll sit down <laughs> and check every request and every idea and every path and try to flip flop them around. It's not going to work. So we need something to solve this problem for red teams. And maybe also for blue teams, because there are, there are kind of two different ways of looking about this. There's finding the bugs before they occur, and there's finding the bugs when they're already in the wild. And so we'll start with Cameron, ostensibly, being the red team in this equation, and find something to give red teams. It needs to be high fidelity. It needs to give good results. It needs to be the sort of thing that if we pick it up and set it down in front of a red team, they'll actually get stuff out and not noise and false positives. The more sieving and manual effort they have to do, the less valuable this is for us. So we started off with a, the, this is kind of like a tax, taxonomical history of different things we went through. We started off very small. We had a little tool. I'm not one for names, really. Uh, so we just called it a little inspector. And we started doing what Cameron was doing, but in a tool-assisted manner. We sit down, do a bunch of things in Burp Suite, go through the history, go through the requests, go through the IDs. Ah, but now we can query against open API specifications. So say we look at like a billing API. We have the spec for it. We can look at the spec. We can look at the request. And we know exactly all the parameters that we can pass in. We all know all the ways it can be called. And it gives us a lot more insight than staring at it and guessing what 
the random GUIDs floating around within it might mean. We might be able to guess, but not all the IDs are as clearly named as in the bodies of JSON. And after this, after we had the ability to do our little tool-assisted investigation and found that this was good and it sped things up, it gave us good results, we wanted to take it a little step further. We have the manual step of gathering the information in Burp Suite and gathering all these HTTP requests, but we want to cut that down and we need to turn what's in Burp Suite into a form that's programmatically digestible. Burp Suite allows you to save your HTTP request history as an XML file. Um, I am personally not a big fan of XML files, uh, so we made a little tool to turn it into anything else. Um, and I wasn't sure what we wanted, so we made it turn it into a lot of different stuff. And we tried a lot of different solutions, and the one that ended up sticking was mostly JSON. Uh, we kept JSON around, good format, a little bit e happier for machines than XML, and a lot happier for me than XML. And it does all sorts of stuff. It'll like encode the HTTP requests and bodies in base64 for like compactness. And you know, we we weren't sure where they wanted this to go, so we tried a whole bunch of different solutions. We had a bunch of shell scripts for a while that we just run against it and just regex parts of the requests out to try to figure out what would stick for replacing all of these in mass and doing this testing in mass. And what grew out of that was a little tool to do all of this automatically. It was called Correlator. This is the Cameron bot of the equation. And this takes any number of open API specifications, as many as you want. You can feed it uh, like a folder full of like 50 of them or more. Who cares? And it'll go through all of them, table all of them, go through a burp history, and turn it into a format it understands, and you feed it. Two little info files, if you want. One of them contains all of the information you know about the environment you're attacking. So in it, from like a defensive point of view, this might be useful in like purple teaming if you have a fixed test environment that you want to explore. Or if you're acting offensively, it's the sort of thing you can grow as you investigate because you know subscription ID, billing ID, payment ID, all these things, and you can fill out this information. And it takes that and it smushes it all together, and in the least form, it gives you back all the requests that it thinks you already have specs for. Uh, so out of the total full history that you've not curated at all, you just record yourself doing things, shove it into some specs, and it says, well, here are the ones that we know how they work. And then you can ask it to transform it. What Cameron does is manually go through and change these ident identifiers in the JSON bodies and the URL paths, things like that. This does the same thing. And it allows you to change it between, say, two different tenants. So you could feed it a subscription ID from one and tell it to please change it to a subscription ID from another. And you can do all sorts of little combinatorics with that. Maybe you just switch out tokens. Maybe you switch out IDs. Maybe you switch out all sorts of stuff. In the, in the fun edge case also, Cameron mentioned, that maybe you visit a specific path and the auth doesn't stick at all. Well, if you want to do that, maybe you just take out the auth token entirely. You just blank it out in the transformation and now you have a test to see if auth is enforced ever for these requests. Does the request for you, feeds it back, all good stuff. This is a messy little hand diagram. Uh, this is my attempt at describing how this all gets folded together. So in like a XML BERT file, you'll get like your get request and you'll have like a ID, some other identifier, maybe it's a string, who knows, you get specs. And it does all this mutation on it and some from to substitution. And at the end of the day, you get out a new request, which it will make on your behalf if you want to, or you can just look at it. But usually you want to actually make the request. This is only for offensive work. This still has the manual part of having to go through and collect this burp history of all these different calls, which means that there's still a burdensome manual component. You still have to go through, you still have to explore everything, and you have to get this corpus of actual information for you to modify and transpose. Thus, for the blue team perspective, that's not particularly desirable. We instead work in a slightly different direction with Generator where we take a only one open API specification and a possibly shared, possibly unique, hard to say, um, identifier 
database, which is this little thing that's kind of over here. It's just a little text file, and in the basic form, it might just be some ID equals ABC, who knows? And we have a little extra rule grammar that we can put in there to restrict it to different paths, different APIs, all sorts of things. High reusability, though. And this allows us to do transformations, similar to how Correlator does them, and transform requests into a form we want to test. Maybe it just sub substitutes out uh, the tenant authorization token. And maybe it just builds all the requests valid for a testing environment for tenant A, and all it does is swap out the token for tenant B and run all the requests. If we get any requests back that are expected by specifications, so 200s and things like that, we know that something bad has happened. For once, getting a positive result is a very bad thing. If we get a 200 back, it's a red flag. At worst, it might be a cosmetic bug where maybe we just don't want to have 200 style requests with no content. Maybe from a hygiene perspective, it indicates that there's off not being enforced near it, but maybe not for the specific path. It could give us a lot of information. So handy dandy for actually finding the cross-tenant bugs from a defensive perspective. Take a spec, gives us very similar things. We get a path, we get out all of our methods like get and post, we get out some type information. We can maybe infer types if we need to, fill in dummy values or maybe fuzz values, if that's the sort of thing we want to do. And then it builds the request, makes the request, examines the responses, and gives you kind of a report at the end that says, well, these are the requests that came back that were suspicious. You should probably review them, because in a worst case, they're actual CTDL exploits. And in the best case, uh, it's maybe a hygiene issue that you should clean up, because this should never happen. And we applied this to graph. And this is where things start to get interesting. Uh, with the graph API is very large. The graph API is like 30,000 requests are described in it. 30,000 different paths. And I believe that's before we take into consideration like get and post methods and things like that. It's very, very large. It's a huge specification. And we wanted to go bug hunting in it. And boy, did we find bugs. It happened. And the, the fun part about that is we found bugs that Cameron didn't find. Sure. We found bugs that Cameron found that regressed. If you remember in his G Suite discussion about the changes between UIs causing bug regressions, the same thing happens here, where Cameron had a bug, it was fixed, and then Generator came back and it was like, ah, oh, no, no, no. It's not fixed. <laughs> it's not fixed at all. And we get to go back to the graph team and say, what's up with that? And it was pretty fast at it, too. I mean, 30,000 different paths. It takes about four and a half seconds to actually build the requests from the identifier information for all those things and build it into memory. And then about five minutes to actually perform all the requests without getting a slap on the hand from rate limiting telling you to stop. Um, and we just gave that to the graph team, because if we get results back and they say 200 or anything like that, we're doing the standard like tenant A, tenant B swap, where we build all the requests for tenant A, swap out the token for tenant B, and you can do a few other things with this, like maybe you take out the token entirely, test for auth at all, or maybe you take a low privilege or a guest token and run it through everything and see if the guest token sticks for different requests. You have a lot of options, and it gives you the chance to find these kind of more difficult permission, elevation of privilege, information disclosure kind of bugs in a way that we didn't really have a good way to hunt for before. And now, we, in five minutes, we can audit the entirety of the Graph API, which is a significant improvement from sitting down and flipping through everything manually and flipping through all different IDs manually. So this is a pretty solid solution as far as we're concerned for hunting internally and preventing these in the first place. After Graph, um, for the record, everything we found was fixed. Everything that we looked at and reported was fixed. And the Graph team has these to do as they please the, with the tooling and whatnot. And all the regressions we found were fixed, and any variants of them were also fixed. And everything was remediated. So there's a happy ending to the story. We had a few other supporting tools that cropped up along the way, a few different approaches that we had over time. I, the, the, we had a little tool for generating, or try to infer identifiers from like an open API spec or like a burp history and try to build the ID 
database for you and a few other things like that. Or we had a few like just token generator tools that would just spit out tokens for us to shove into scripts and we could build out little uh, flip-flopping uh, bear token swaps, which was pretty handy dandy. And for a while we had a particularly a uh, fun little approach that uh, didn't stick because it wasn't very performant, but rolling out um, the burp suite history into a virtual file system and just trying to uh, script on top of that, which brought complexity down a little bit, but it was a little too slow to uh, keep up with what we wanted it to do. Looking forward, we've reached out to scanning teams, we've reached out to DevOps teams, we've reached out to all sorts of people and handed this stuff over, different teams. And we look to expand this. It's still something that's being worked on. Uh, we have lots of other incidents and lots of other bugs and cases and whatnot to go through on our time that competes with things like this. But we've given it out and we've handed it to people. And we're trying to make it faster, better, stronger, all the good stuff. And try to fix it up with like asynchronous delivery. It can express itself as an API. and with you could theoretically make a request against it for something like graph. And then it's an API where you feed it an API spec, you feed it some identifiers, and it goes through and it builds all of this out for you, but you don't want to be waiting five minutes for an HTTP response. That's not, that's not the sort of thing we want to have. Some of it's public. These are snapshots. These were not final or polished products. These were snapshots that were taken out at some point along the way and put up on my work GitHub, so if you feel free to get a bit, at least to give you an idea of what we ended up building out, especially the graph uh, changes were pretty extensive and haven't made it into here because, well, it's a little purpose built at this point, at least in the fork for graph. So it needs a little bit of love there. And as we look back on what Cameron did, found, and what I did, found, Carolina, all, all of our work and all this investigation, these bugs are not hard to find. The, 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 these are not secrets. The, uh, unique identifiers are unique identifiers, but they're not secret tokens or off keys or any cryptographic secrets or anything like that. These are just little strings of characters that can end up in logs or end up guessed or accidentally serialized. We, we can't rely on them to protect ourselves. They're not security controls. We need off and we need proper control and proper permission enforcement. And we can't have even backend services that you just feed an ID and it just goes off and does something. It's not, it's, it's, it's not acceptable and it's the sort of thing we need to find and hunt down. And we do, and we do find, and we do hunt down. Um, regressions are possible. If we change the UI, if we didn't fix it in the back end, we need to go back and we need to fix it in the back end. I mean, this, if we, but, but the first step is making sure that we fix it right in the first place, and if there are regressions, that we catch them if they show up, which now we're equipped to do, and had controls for it in the past, and we still have all of those today, so we lost nothing. Permissions must always be enforced. We're not doing questions, but thank you. Uh, we'll be at the table in the back room over there if you wish to talk to Camerai later.